Yo, Rene, good to have you in the show. Hello, how are hey. you? All good, man, and you? It's, yeah, good. It's funny to talk Dutch to a Dutchie. Or yeah. to English to a Dutchie. Yeah. yeah, exactly. You have to keep shifting. And that's yeah. my that's my life nowadays because I have uh, multiple international clients. I have to keep switching from English to Dutch. And yeah. Yeah. <laughs> You'll get used to it. But you speak a lot of English too, right? Yeah, basically every day. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, especially on email probably. Job. Sorry, again? Especially on email probably. Yeah, also email, but a lot of phone calls as well with labels and stuff and, and, and booking agencies and stuff. So, yeah, yeah. yeah. Where's, yeah. Your, where's your booking agency uh, based? In the Netherlands? Um, well, the, the, the central uh, booking um, agency is in Amsterdam. It's called Lee Wine. Oh, so it's Leonike. Leonike, yeah. yeah, yeah. I've, I've had her on the show as well, probably like, I think a year ago or something, maybe longer. Right. All right. Yeah, yeah. She manages Eric E. Funkerman, uh, Lucas and Steve. You know all those yeah. guys. So, uh, yeah. Cool. Yeah, I'm very happy with her. Yeah. <laughs> Helene, don't don't miss out Helene. So <laughs> she's cool as well. Yeah. She's yeah. I, really I've cool. not, I'm not sure if I've met her. I've had a few email conversations with her. I yeah. think that's when we booked you and Funkerman for the party here in uh, oh, yeah. my hometown yeah. in Tilburg. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Uh, that's already, it's also like four or five years ago. Yeah. yeah. Anyway, uh, thanks for being on the show. Thanks for taking the time uh, to do this. Um, it's probably not necessary, but for the people who don't know you yet, for the people who don't know your name, because you've been in the industry for a long time, um, yeah. at least I've been playing your tracks from the beginning off since I started playing music. Yeah. Um, who who is Rene Ames? Like, where where did it all started for you? Um, well, <laughs> like the very first the very first point where it started was like twenty one years ago now. So that's twenty one uh, years. Oh shit, that almost nine. Twenty years. <laughs> <laughs> so that that was when I was nineteen and I had my first release in uh, on um, on the World of Dance recordings. Mm -hmm. And uh, yeah, well, you know. 21 years ago and it took off from there lots of practicing and uh, I, I bought I bought my first gear uh, from the it's called heritage from my father's death it's called heritage right in English oh, yeah, yeah. yeah it's heritage yeah and somebody dies and it's not funny but I got yeah. money from that and I bought my first equipment from that when I was 16 mm -hmm. what so kind I, of equipment like because I can imagine that at that time there was no software or anything it was probably no, hardware yeah well, I bought um, a very old Akai um, XL1000 sample keyboard or something, mm -hmm. which could only sample on uh, 12 kilohertz or uh, I don't know, <laughs> no, 12 bit. It was 12 bit. <laughs> 12 sorry. bit, yeah. yeah. So it was really old and, uh, and a Roland D50 synthesizer. Mm -hmm. And um, I had an Atari Falcon um, with Cubase on it. Mm -hmm. So it was, uh, yeah, it was really old school. Was really. it Cubase 1.0 or? I don't know. Maybe. A long, <laughs> long time ago. It was old. Yeah, 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 yeah. It was a long time ago. But that was my first gear. And then uh, uh, an Akai MPC followed. And that was my, you know, the, I used that one as a sequencer. Mm -hmm. um, after the Atari and then the software, I think, came, you know, the, the PCs yeah. with software. And that's how that's, how was that shift for you and maybe still uh because the techniques has uh yeah has grown a lot uh, yeah has shifted a lot actually how did that change uh, anything for you like what do you prefer to to use the more old school way of producing or the more like the, the software kind of things oh the software yeah definitely yeah yeah it's a lot of less a lot of less hassle you know yeah it's, Back in the day, you had to, to um, you know, now you can work on like 100 projects at the same time. Yeah. You know, you can save what you did, what you what you did on the synthesizers. And back, back then, you know, you, you had to make sure nobody touches the knobs. Yeah. You don't want the sounds change, you know, and you could work on only one project at a time. Yeah. Or you, could, you, you can work on a lot of projects, but you'll lose the mix, you know. Yeah. You have to remember Switch. where all the buttons were. That's it. So yeah, oh, now it's a little less hassle, and everything sounds so good with with the with the software nowadays, you know. And uh, yeah. yeah, so I prefer this, it's like software. Yeah, yeah, I can imagine. So twenty one years ago, you started off making music. Yeah. And 
when did your DJ career start? Um, well, that was, you know, I started practicing making music when I was 16. So that's uh, 24 years ago. Mm -hmm. And I started DJing when I was like practicing DJing when I was 17 or 18 years old. And I had this old Akai turntable with, the, with, a, with a pitch control with a little knob. Yeah. <laughs> And I had a CD player next to it without pitch control, and I kept on mixing the same, ah. the same records. You know, it was hardcore DJ Paul and Neophyte and all these guys. You oh, know, really? I bought vinyls. Yeah. Was that also the style that you produced, hardcore? Uh, no, no, no. That was more like techno and tech house because ah, okay. I was influenced by by Michel de High, Ronald Molendijk, You know, the guys who had the who played on in Nighttime Club back in the days in Rotterdam. So that was my my influence. Okay, that's what I made. But I I got to practice on hardcore music. You know, so yeah. I love thing. Yeah, yeah. yeah so, and and so. what did it? What triggered you to uh, start a DJing? Because it's it's a whole different discipline. Um, I, I think because of my environment, you know, like uh, we went to our local club mm -hmm. uh, and that's where they uh, they had these hardcore parties back in the days with the Force DJ team and the you know, um, <laughs> DJ Panic and, you know, those guys. Yeah. And, um, you know, a lot of my friends had turntables, so I got to practice there. So it was just, you know, and my, my father was a DJ as well on a radio station. So, oh, really? you know, the DJing part... It was just like a natural thing, you know, it was, you know, and I had the luck that my environment was, was DJ friendly as well. Yeah, so, exactly. Because yeah. Uh, you were also studying at that moment or? Um, mm, yeah, while, while I was practicing the stuff, I was, I was, uh, I was um, on, uh, yeah, they call, in, in Holland, they call it HAVO. Mm -hmm. So that's, I, yeah, I think it's like, thing. I don't know, yeah. <laughs> high school. <laughs> Over algemeen uh, uh, voortgezet onderwijs. <laughs> but uh, yeah, that, I finished that and I was already practicing music, but I was all, also um, uh, a youth football player on a high level at Sparta Rotterdam and oh, really? Willem II en Dordrecht 90, FC Dordrecht. Did you play at Willem II? Ja, yeah, I did. Yeah. Oh, shit, that's my hometown. Yeah, it was a couple of months, but it was too much of a travel, you know. Did and you play in the first team or in like the... No, no it was, yeah, first team of the youth. Oh, so okay, yeah. It's only wow. 14 back then and I played in the national youth squad and stuff. But uh, yeah, that's what I did. Like that was my school and that was my situation. So. Mm -hmm. Yeah, because how was that, how was that for you to... Uh, because you didn't do like a follow-up study, right? Like no uh, university or whatever. Um. No, well, partly yes, but um, after, when I was 18, I finished school, mm -hmm. school, and then I got to work, sell televisions and sell uh, um, radios, uh, washing machines and everything, mm -hmm. and I did that for two years, and then I went back to school to um, study um, computer science. They call mm -hmm. it informatica in, in Dutch. I don't yeah. know how it's called. In, it's uh, I, I think it's ICT or something. Something like that. I did that for a year, and then I um, I wasn't good at maths, so um, mathematics, how do you mm -hmm. call it? Yeah. And, um, um, I started as a web designer, did that for two and a half years, and when I was 24, I got uh, into full time into music. I got the chance to work for Midtown Recordings, oh. in, and back in the days when it was still existing, mm -hmm. and I worked there full time in the studio for uh, four years, and. Uh, and that's how I learned the basics, yeah. And you and you worked there as a mix engineer or? Everything, mixing engineers, creating their CDs, making tracks for several artists. You know, it was hard house, trance, uh, house, techno, tech house, everything. So, oh, wow. So that's actually where your music career kind of took off. Yeah, yeah. That's that's where I learned to really produce music. And I was lucky that I got the chance to, to do that job. Yeah, in a great studio. Uh, in a great studio, yeah, but I was talented, you know. I'm still talented, I hope. <laughs> <laughs> I was talented, so that's that, they they picked that up, and I was willing to work for for really little money. Yeah, you know, my 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 friends they wanted to work for money. Also in the music business, a lot of my friends had dreams to work in the music business, but you know, a couple of friends got the chance to work in a studio like that as well, like for in, in Hollywood Music Hall in Rotterdam, but. The money was no good, so they said no. I rather work as a as a this or a that. Yeah. 
I said, okay, give me a couple of hundred euros. I'm going to work in a studio full time. I don't care. I want to learn it, you know? I'll be there, yeah. I think so, that's the best mindset, you know, like uh, yeah. having some kind of internship, a paid in internship or just a free internship. I think you learn the most from actually doing it. And uh, spending four years in a studio like that with people around you who have maybe more knowledge than you had at that moment, uh, it's a great way to learn. Oh, there, there was nobody that had more um, knowledge of producing music than me okay. because that was my job. But uh, the knowledge these people had in Midtown was with how a record should sound and how it sells and how the industry works, you yeah, know, yeah. selling the records. Yeah. So for me, that was like a, a good um, learning school like production wise but also how the industry worked you know yeah i can imagine and did you also start building your network there so starting to know new people yeah yeah i did like um uh, what i learned in midtown recordings i also use it in my home studio mm -hmm. and that was a different kind of music that i made and um like after one year working for midtown recordings when i was 24 25 years old mm -hmm. i met the guys from extrema extreme yeah. music festival and you know they had an agency as well and they had a couple of record labels and i met uh peter van hell and roger dasse you know them mm -hmm. probably um yeah. bas baatse who is my who is my best friend and he was my uh how do you say that when you marry you have something who signs for you uh, uh, what, isn't <laughs> that know? like the guy the, the man uh, no fuck Best, my best man. Your best man, yeah, of course. <laughs> my wedding. Yeah. Those three guys, they formed Extrema Music with all the labels that Peter Van Hell had, you know, and I released music on, on Extrema and got mm -hmm. to play on the Extrema events. And that was still when, when I was working at Midtown Recordings. And, you know, there was a point that after two and a half years, I decided to, to quit at Midtown and took further steps with, uh, with uh, Peter Gelderblom, who's... Yeah. Uh, who's doing good things now with his Timazo uh, company. Mm -hmm. But uh, yeah, I, I started working with him after two and a half years with Midtown and also uh, kept working with, uh, with Extrema. Yeah. And so that was the second step. And yeah. that's when you started making money from your own music. Yeah, yeah. So, so yeah. at what age was that, 26 or? When I was 26, yeah. I yeah. started to have like gigs here and there because I was with Extrema. Mm -hmm. And I made sure I made like a like thousand or fifteen hundred euros yeah. a month on gigs, yeah. together with with uh, with uh, royalties I I, uh, I earned. You know, like every enough. quarter, it's, it was enough to live from. Yeah, yeah. So that was the basic foundation of what I do now. Yeah, nice. So um, a long time in the music industry, lots of uh, lots of knowledge I can imagine. So, you know, I've been in the industry for about. 15 years now i think um i've seen a lot changing in in the last few years what did you see changing and what did you what do you like the most about the changes in the music industry right now mm, well it's more the change i see is the growth like like the scene has got so big mm -hmm. it hasn't changed that much like uh with with networking or you know the the way the music is brought into uh like the music is made you know it mm -hmm. technically it, it it it's involved of course and yeah. but the basic strategy uh, strategy yeah, to, to, strategy. yeah to get there is basically the same but yeah. because of everything is so big and so much new talent is there mm -hmm. You have to be more sharp, more, yeah, you say that. It's, uh, yeah, it's, it's just more competition, so you have to... It's more competition, that's it, yeah, yeah. That, that's, that's, that's it. That's what has changed mm -hmm. for me, you know, yeah. And how do you like the, the fact that you can, like, use social media and have all these, like you were mentioning when we had the talk before uh, about your label, that you actually yeah. have the option to have your own label right now and to release your yeah. own music and... How do you experience those things? Do you think it's a good thing that you can actually bypass the label, release your own music in your own tempo on the your on the date you would like to have uh, on your own rules? Do you think it's a good thing? There's a long story behind that. And <laughs> <laughs> it's um, we know you you started with social media. 
I'm not, I don't like social media, to be honest, and I'm not really strong with it. I have to learn with it, uh, learn to, to use it, you know, still mm -hmm. after years that it's, it, it's, it's important for so many years already, but I'm not strong at it yet. Okay. Still. <laughs> okay. Yeah. Um, and, you know, unfortunately it's important. The, the the social media thing you know now instagram I, I like instagram though because it's easy to to do you know it's mm -hmm. easy to 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 make nice fi pictures from the studio from your gigs and everything and but it's so much hassle so much work you know facebook twitter instagram where you have more spotify i just start, started spotify i should have two years ago you know what i mean that's 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 okay, how yeah. i am what you, you really just started what, having your own account there you mean or um, I had my account for a year, but I didn't do anything with it. So oh, it's, uh, wow. okay. I just I, I created my first playlist like one year, one week ago. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, you, I know. You should step that. You should step that game up. <laughs> I know. So I'm busy with that. And regarding my own label, it's um, like I said before we were recording this uh, this uh, mm -hmm. this interview. Um, I set it up because I want want to have a label that I'm I, I want to be able to like you said release music whenever I want mm -hmm. but not everything on my label because my label is still small and you know it costs a lot of money to good to do good promotion so mm -hmm. I treat my label as a when I have a release gap somewhere mm -hmm. which is not very uh, nice to have because it can cost you DJ shows and, and, and your name is going to get down if you're not there with a release uh, yeah. once in a while. So then, then I put it on my own label when I have a release gap. Mm -hmm. But I still try to get my release on the biggest labels like True Room and, and you know, uh, I want to do something on Sola. I want to do something on, on Relief again. You know, it's been a long time since I've been on those labels. Yeah. So, yeah. That's why I have the label to, yeah. to keep there, to keep my name there. But you know, it's it's still important to have records on the big labels. Yeah. Yeah. And do you like the fact that it's that it's possible? Like uh, because that has changed in the last twenty years. Twenty years ago, you were relying on only the labels. You know, like they were in charge yeah. of when your music got out there. Right now, you have the option to do it yourself. Yeah, it's easy. Yeah. It's easy to, to set up a label right now, yeah. but it's very difficult to get it big, you know? Yeah, sure. But you can also just release your music through websites like TuneCore or DistroKid and uh, like not run a label, but still get your music out there. Yeah, I so. never tried that. So I don't know very much about that topic, but, uh, you know. Yeah, it's, it's quite the with... same. It's quite yeah, I have, yeah I, have, I have my label with LabelWorks. Mm-hmm. And um, I just upload my tracks with the artwork and some info, and they distribute it to all the the, the big stores and streaming yeah. platforms like Spotify. It's, it's the exact same, exact tracks, same thing. Everything. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Okay. Perfect. So I do it with label works then. <laughs> yeah. Oh, perfect. Yeah. There's there's like probably a dozen of platforms who who yeah. deliver those kind of services. I and just, I see the label. The, I see the label is growing. You know, the the beatboard followers is 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 growing. Also on track stores and stuff. You know, so I see and the income is increasing mm -hmm. steadily, but it's increasing. So the label is growing, and I'm happy with that. But you know, if you want to have like like fast growings, you have to spend like seven hundred or eight hundred pounds. Yeah, marketing on, budget. On marketing and PR, and I, you know, I'm I'm not I'm not poor. <laughs> But I wanna, I don't wanna get poor, you know. <laughs> if I'm doing Good point. Yeah. Eight hundred pounds every release. Yeah. You know, it's too much money. So it's, uh, I just keep, let it grow, like steadily and slowly via my own uh, social media channels. You know, mm -hmm. and that's how I'm doing it. You know. Yeah. Okay. And um, like during all those years, that's the thing that I'm that really makes you stand out from the crowd, in my opinion. Um, and that's why I think this is important to hear for everyone who's listening or watching right now. Um, yeah. Like I said, I've been playing your songs from the beginning. And even when I listen back to your songs from 10, 15 years ago, and I listen to your latest release, I can still hear this is a track from Renee. Yeah. Um, and that has all to do with the fact that it's your sound. And yeah. I think people who are watching and listening right now probably recognize that same sound. The one thing that a lot of people are struggling with, um, a lot of producers in particular, um, is creating their own sound. 
Yeah. The big question always is, are you able to actually develop your own sound by thinking about it? Like, okay, this is, I, I need to think of a certain sound which I'm going to create, or is it just something that's, that grows organically? I think it's the second part mm -hmm. you yeah. you mentioned. It's um, I I was always a very you know my sound is very acoustic sounding you know the drums and everything. It's always it's not too electronic you know it's, yeah. it's just a clap mm -hmm. from a 909 or a 808 from a sample pack and put it on there so like like many records you hear mm -hmm. it's just like that. So it's it's okay because there are hits with with, yeah. with just for claps you know it's about the idea mm -hmm. but. If my sound is defined by a lot of hip hop beats, you know. So I'm using the the, the Neptune sample pack for my drums That's for great, over yeah. for over 15 years now. <laughs> 15 years, I'm I'm using the same sample packs, so I know exactly when I want to have a certain claps or a certain kick, where to grab my samples from, and I know exactly how I mix them, you know, yeah. because that's that's a, that's that's my trained ear. Yeah. And my taste is very hip hop influenced and I put it in house music and I use hip hop samples and you know, so that's how my, my style was developed. It's, it's just one way of mixing. It's just one way of, of using my ears and there's just one way of listening to samples and knowing how they sound in a beat. Yeah. You know, this is always the beat that sounds like me. It's not the use of sounds like the synthesizers, but it's always about the beat in the bass line. So it's actually because you because you have been using the same sample pack over and over and over again, um, that also helps, of course, uh, to the fact that your music always sounds the same, as in has the same the same samples included, which also yeah. helps to create your own sound, of course. Yeah, like like, like I want to give an example. I have to make a right now. I'm making a new uh, online studio tutorial mm -hmm. for Sonic Academy. Mm -hmm. And normally when you, I, I did some tutorials before, normally when you do a tutorial and you use samples from another sample pack from another manufacturer, mm -hmm. they have to clear the samples because they want to give it away or whatever, you know. Mm -hmm. But for this tutor, uh, tutorial, I had to use samples from Sonic Academy only. Ah, okay. But those are all sample packs I've never used. Yeah. You know, of course I've used them for a wash or like, like some hi hat or whatever, you know, just some tiny things. Not that the samples are bad, but I just use my own sample packs. That's yeah. that's, that's it. Mm -hmm. Um, so I got a uh, like a palette with colors with paint, which I don't know how to paint with. You know? <laughs> so I I did a beat right now, but I'm not confident. You know, I'm I'm not content with the beat right now because I had to use the samples. Yeah. I don't know. Yeah. So that's what I mean, you know. So, get the, so you actually never update your sample. Uh, I do for tiny bits, and sometimes yeah. I hear something in a sample that's similar to what I hear in my own sample packs. You know, that's yeah. it's just it's it's rather the trained ear that's important than the sample pack itself. Yeah. And then with your trained ear, you use the same sample packs over and over again. But sometimes you combine things from that well-known sample pack and that, and so yeah, it never sounds the same. But because you know how to mix all those elements, it, yeah. it's, it's like me, you know? Yeah. Ah, yeah it's very hard to explain. It's very hard to explain. Yeah, but it's interesting because I think it's, it's, uh, it has to do with two things, you know? Like one is, of course, the gear, like wh which samples do you use, which clearly yeah. is the same one over and over and over again. That helps to create your own sound. But at the other, t at the other hand, it also is um, your trained ear and the thing that you would like to hear, like your own taste. Yeah, because yeah. you handpicked the samples that you like. You could have chosen a few other ones, but you've decided to chose this ones because they sound the way you like it. Yeah, yeah. So if That's you, awesome. yeah, mm -hmm. I have a before I go in the studio and I have a a clear picture of a, a beat how I want to have a sound. You know, every morning um, I have a new beat in my in my mind in my head. That's really? It. So I always start the morning with a new beat. Mm -hmm know exactly where to grab all the elements from and then in the afternoon I'm I'm going to look for the beats like uh, I'm going through all the beats I did for uh, in that week or that month mm -hmm. then I create some idea and samples and and make uh, make a track out of it yeah oh fun that's yes. like oh, that's a whole different pattern 
that I've heard before. Yeah, sometimes I start with an idea with a synth and then grab another beat yeah. or make some new beat. It just depends. On, yeah. but that, that's that's the way I want to start my morning, you know, to get that feel. You know? And do you make music every day? Yeah. Every yeah. single day? From Monday till Friday, wow. eight hours a day. Well, not eight hours a day anymore because I'm studying now again. Mm -hmm. So make it five, five hours a day. Yeah. Wow. That's a lot. Yeah. And I did... I'm doing that from from my 24th year already. Like, like for like when I was 24 yeah. years old, I started with that. That's and 25 years right now. No, in in total, no, 21 years for a living. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Oof. Yeah, it's a lot of hours. <laughs> yeah, it is. <laughs> Imagine how how long it takes to develop something like that. But like I said, 10 years ago, I already noticed. I think it, the first tracks I played were the um my barbie which i really liked and you like last year or two years ago you did a remake right i did a remake of it yeah that's yeah. so great but also the synths that you use are really it's not standard you know like it's not like a, a standard synth is there something you do differently with that um well yeah it's it's um i always like like raw synth steps and stuff you know it's yeah. a lot of samples a lot mm -hmm. of samples but also sometimes a VST synth, and I always put distortion on it, uh, ring modulators, uh, envelope shapers to make it sharp and short and stuff. And uh, yeah, yeah, that's that's how I I just fuck up the sounds. <laughs> yeah, that's that's all I do. I make them very raw. Yeah, you know, but raw in stuff. a good way, you know. Like I once heard, I don't know, I can't remember where it was, but I once heard from a, a producer that the human ear actually likes to hear uh, distor distorted sounds like broken sounds somehow the human ear likes to likes that that that's sound the key of my success that's the key i think i think <laughs> if you if you think about it you know like <laughs> to me as well like if you listen to uh if i listen to samples as well i like the more crushed ones like the more broken ones i yeah. don't necessarily like the really clean samples no maybe yeah. it's a matter of taste i don't know but once heard it before that someone said the human ear is, desi is designed that it actually likes the dis distorted sounds more than it does clear sounds. I'm not sure yeah. if it's true, but I heard it somewhere. Maybe, yeah. Well, that's the coming back to my like talking about my beats again. My sound, mm -hmm. my beats are always like a little bit crushed and distorted as well. You know. Yeah. Yeah. It and you still sound you still use Cubase right now? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, I started off in Cubase as well. Really liked it. Yeah. If I, well, it's not that I don't like other software, but I'm used to work with it, yeah. so I'm not going to change a winning team, you know? Yeah. I I'm had not to... always winning. I must admit, I'm not always winning. <laughs> Good topic maybe to talk about as well. Yeah, like, yeah, maybe. Yeah, that's a great... It's. I think that's an interesting thing. I think for for a lot of people who aren't in the music industry that deep or are, who are just getting started, if they have a look at guys like you, like guys who already made it or had like big tracks and make a living out of music. Yeah. It's really easy to get the feeling that it's really easy, you know, like yeah. making music and you wake up and make music and there's a big next big hit ready to go. Um, but how often do you actually like finish a track, release a track? Uh, how much, how much of your time are you actually happy with what you're doing and how much gets uh, trashed? Oh, uh, well, I think I think I have to talk about the last ten years then, because I think everybody goes like all artists goes with they experience times of ups and downs. You know, mm -hmm. like ten years ago, that was a really really big up for me. Mm -hmm. I made I made some really big hits, mm -hmm. like uh, Strike Me Down, you know, and uh, and had a couple of good tunes with Peter Gelblom together with him. Mm -hmm. So. I was still with extreme music then and my, my career took off. Like I was flying to different to three, four different countries every week. Mm -hmm. And um that last for like that lasted for like three or four years. Then I left extreme music. They they uh, they stopped extreme music, so I had to go with, with one management back then. Mm -hmm. And it was still good, but times changed back then also music wise so i was still doing good doing my releases on tour room and stuff you know but mm -hmm. i didn't have these big radio hits anymore so i wasn't earning the big bucks anymore the big money you mm -hmm. know but i was still doing good and that point lasted all the way to now 
mm-hmm. you know i you know i have some some hits here and there on tool room you know with mark knight and green velvet i did live stream one year ago yeah and I had a couple of uh, records like uh, Like It Deep on Two Room as well. And we had Lore together with Farrick Dawn on, on Spinning Deep. And mm-hmm. I had some other cool records on Suara recordings and stuff. So that's good. But um, so sometimes I really have really big downs, you know. Mm-hmm. And, and then all of a sudden, out of nothing, while well, you haven't done anything special. Like last year, I had a really good 2018 with lots of shows in different countries and you know, uh, I was doing good financially wise as well. I had nothing to complain, but I didn't do anything special for over a year, one and a half year. The last one and a half year, half year uh, one and a half year, yeah. I didn't do anything special. But what's special in no your really opinion? Special. If you talk about special, what's special? Something special is a release on Tool Room or one of the other big labels. You know, I had one release on 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 uh, Green Velvet's label on uh, on Relief, mm-hmm. but it was a release was a release on a compilation. Mm-hmm. And it's not that I didn't want to do the, that good music, or I I didn't get the chance to get a release on on Tool Room or whatever big label. But right now, I'm starting to get back in the studio again, like. There wasn't no, there was no flow. There was no Rene Ames in the studio anymore for one and a half years. I don't know why. Yeah. So that that took a, a, a good a good reality check last week. I had a good reality check. So what what did I do one last one and a half years? I was playing PlayStation when I didn't know what to do in the studio because there was no flow. Yeah. That's not the right way to do it. Don't go and 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 do some PlayStation whatever. Just figure out why you you're not making it in the studio. What's the reason? Yeah. You can find a reason why it's not why it's not working. So yeah. that's what I did last week. And, and now you found I, the reason. Yeah, the reason was that I was lazy. Uh, lazy. I was getting lazy. Really? Okay. It started. It started one and a half year ago. Two years ago, I was I had a really big dip, mm-hmm. and I worried about that. And when you worry, you're not create. You're not creative. Your mm-hmm. creativity goes down when you're worrying. Mm-hmm. So. Um that changed that period changed my way of working. I was not motivated anymore. Yes. So that got my way of working from 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 that point on. That that was my way of working. Being lazy and not you know, being lazy and not and not um motivated anymore. That was my way of working till all the way till a few weeks ago. So now I'm doing good. I'm yeah. doing really good. I have nothing to complain, but there was a time with if I s- stay working like this, it's not going to work. So yeah. I have to, I have to stay in the studio, listen to other producers, what I never did, watch other studio tutorials. I never did it, you know, make a plan on paper. So that's what I did. I made a plan on paper, what to do to get back in the studio, to get motivated. And now I'm there. Let's see what happens this year. Yeah. Nice. And did you figure this out yourself or did you, did you had a coach or like? No, <clears throat> I, um, I started studying. Mm-hmm. Uh, again, uh, computer informatics, okay, or informatica, computer mm-hmm. uh, science. I don't know how you call it in English. And it has a part that's uh, um, bedrijfskunde. Mm-hmm. You know how you call it in in English, bedrijfs. Um, business yeah. business school. Yeah, yeah. You, you you the first part of the of the the course is about how how a business is set up and how to make a plan to have a good business Mm -hmm. and how to read business models and stuff, you know? Mm -hmm. And that set me thinking, oh, I have to do this for my own situation as well. I'm not a business, but on the other hand, I am a business, you know? Yeah, that's that's the thing that's interesting because that's the way I see it. I really see being an artist as being a business. But yeah. because you you kind of had the same path as a lot of artists, other artists have had as well. Like you started off as a hobby and it, it developed into a business yeah. s- smoothly. Like that took years, you know, yeah. it didn't happen in a week. Yeah. So when did you realize I'm running a business here? I need to make money. I need to do this. I need to do that. Ago. A few weeks ago. Really? Yeah. Yeah. Wow. I was doing something, releasing music and at... Like years ago, everything went with a finger click. Like, oh, I made a track, uh, Two Room, Suara, Spinning, whatever kind of label. They liked it. Oh, here you have it. Sign it. That's it. And That's you it. never thought about anything else? <clears throat> no, I was just doing this. And wow. I, I never thought about the business model. So now I, I, I wrote down on the paper mm-hmm. a few weeks 
what I didn't do right and what to do right if you want to get up there again. Mm-hmm. Just write it down. Also, like for new talent or guys who, who are not there yet and who want to make a living out of it, write down what an artist needs, in your opinion, and then um, like see if it matches your 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 bad your bad habits or your bad points you know yeah. write down what you're doing what you're doing wrong in your opinion mm-hmm. compare them to a list of what you have to do to get up there and get dj shows and stuff yeah. and then see what and then make a plan like oh these are my my points and these are the points i'm doing wrong yeah let's go what i'm going to work on so for me that was make a spotify list make a dj mix every month um in the studio i have a whole new way of working wrote written down on paper so follow all these steps which you have to do to to get up there again or to get up there for the first time i don't know (laughs) but i think that one of the biggest pitfalls at least i had that i had it a few times and i listening to your story i guess you had it as well staying motivated and staying triggered um to get going with the music is difficult as in you have this big ups and you have this big downs and it's really hard to get yourself going every time to to get back in that mindset to get back in that mood um what really happened for me and i'm not sure if if you've already dived into it deeper but what really happened uh helped for me is figuring out what triggered me yeah and that's maybe sounds a bit too vague but i started listening to like my body like what's my body telling me and i noticed that when i'm listening to podcast episodes certain podcast episodes uh, or when i watch uh, music documentaries i get hyped as in i get all the energy you know like i feel like okay i need to go i need to go i need to do this i need to do that and so I, i started noticing those things help me to get motivated and to get me in the right mindset uh, yeah. So I started listening to podcasts every day, every morning when I wake up, I listen to 15 minutes, 30 minutes, 20 minutes, wh- whatever I can get in there. I listen to a podcast and it just instantly helps me to get into the right mindset. For me, it's the same. Like I, I am, I'm an Instagram addict a mm-hmm. little bit too much. That's also in my plan, by the way. Don't <laughs> do too much Instagram anymore. Don't watch it too much anymore. Yeah. Because it distracts me from what I'm doing. Yeah, you start procrastinating. Uh, like. Yeah, but you know, I'm, for instance, uh, this morning, um, I'm a really big fan of uh, of uh, Dennis Ferrer mm-hmm. and his, his deep housey, housey, techy sound. Yeah. And I saw a little clip of a event he was playing at, and he played a tune. I was like, "Wow, oh, man! Shit! <laughs> I have to do this as well." Like, and I, that changed my mindset again. Like. Yep. All right, let's go in the studio. Fuck the studying uh, part, the course, which I normally do in the morning. Mm-hmm. I study, but no, I was, yeah, I have to go hype. I was yeah, exactly, hype. Yeah. Sick. So that's what you mean as well. Like, yeah. Uh, yeah. And I yeah. think that's important, you know, as soon as you know what gets you off, like what triggers you to, uh, to get that energy flowing again, as soon as you find that out, that's really important. Yeah. Because yeah. I, I've had a period, uh, as you've mentioned, I've had that the same thing. Like I've also been into the studio for, well, I've actually not been in the studio for like a year or maybe a year and a half where I just didn't know what to do. I just yeah. became lazy because the gigs came in, uh, like I fl- flew over the world. I didn't really find a reason to make music anymore. And I didn't really felt like it because I wasn't really challenged. You know, I, yeah. wasn't, I wasn't really, yeah, I didn't know what kind of genre to do. Yeah, yeah, that that's that's just a small part of my problem. Sometimes it's uh, yeah, yeah. You know, uh, for some reason, my music didn't sound good enough last year. You know, I had good releases there, like I said, live stream and yeah. and, and the release with uh, with uh, Farrick Dunn called Duncan Duncan on uh, on Armada Subject mm-hmm. did well as well. You know, those were good records, but. Somehow I didn't know how to let my record sound as good as it normally does, you know. Yeah. So, and you know now it's it's getting back there bit by bit. So it's uh, in my opinion, but I think so. It, it's going to work. So yeah. Well, the, the... My, I also wrote down a goal. What what's my goal at the end of 2019? Mm-hmm. I want to have the same amount of shows that I have in 2018 because mm-hmm. it was a year. 
but I want to have more records on the good labels. That's my goal. How am I going to do that? Wrote it down, plan made, do it, be be, be confident and listen, do a lot of a being listening to other tracks as well. That's mm-hmm. what I never did. I just, you know, I was confident. It's my record. It's my sound. I'm king. I'm doing it. <laughs> yeah. So that's how it works. So I, I'm listening to another, to, to other tracks now as well. I did it. I did a being like for the mixing part of my tracks, yeah. but not for the sound and you know what's hot and what's not hot right now so uh, wow and it's so great to hear man like i i really didn't i would have never guessed that you didn't thought about the business side never um well okay you know i had some questions from um the people in the artist coaching community facebook group as well Uh, and so if you're uh, okay with it let's dive into those and uh, see what, what we can get from them yeah one of them is how many tracks do you produce per year and how much of them do you actually release uh and there's another part to the question how do you maintain a constant level of quality so first how much tracks do you release and how much do actually get released well i'm i think in average i make one track a week Mm -hmm. sometimes two sometimes one in two weeks but i think uh, the amount of tracks i really finish is like four per month three or four and then once every two months there's one track that a label wants to have wow so (laughs) if that answers the question (laughs) that's it you know i'm producing every day and i make a lot of like basic setups for tracks and stuff but like one out of ten um make it to 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 to, uh to finish it and then when once it's finished Mm -hmm. It's not even sure if it's going to get released. But so why not? Why not release it yourself? Because it must be a good track, you know. Like, well, sometimes it's not. You know, it's just not. You know what I explained like earlier, yeah. in, in, like in the middle of the the, the interview. It's, it's it all depends. It's just sometimes. you know sometimes it's just not good. Enough. If you listen to to the track like the next morning, mm-hmm. a lot of times it sounds like shit. You know, I don't know why, but it's just it just happens like that. It's just one one track every two months. It's it's good for a release, okay. and then and then it's still not a hit. You still have to like see what happens. It's yeah. just it's also a matter of luck. Yeah. Okay. And um, does a booker really help? And do you think it's worth to have one? Well, there was, there was a second part of the oh, question. Oh yeah, sorry. How do you maintain a constant level of quality? Yeah. That's hard. I think that's that's that you do that automatically because you have a, a, a certain level of quality for yourself. Like what you define is quality, what's good enough, that's what you automatically maintain. That's that's a good answer, yeah. yeah. It's that's just, the way that, I see it. It's also a lot of luck. Like, you know, it's just like a lottery. Mm-hmm. Sometimes you have these elements... From from my own sample pack for 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 the trademark sample sample series on mm-hmm. on Blue Room, sometimes I have a loop from that, and I have some crazy some crazy programming with hi hats and, and and congas and some sounds from the from the Neptune sample pack, and that's quality at that time and it stays quality. And sometimes that doesn't happen for three or four yeah. weeks. It just depends. It's uh, sometimes you know. it just all fits together like. Yeah, yeah, you just, it's just some luck. It's a lot of luck, yeah. Okay. Um, and does a booker really help you? And does it? Uh, do you think it's worth to have one? Um, yeah, a booker helps because they have the network mm-hmm. with clients and they can sell you in a package with a with a lot of other artists, you know? They, they can sell, like, to, to a festival, they can sell a package of five artists and you're one of them. Mm-hmm maybe not <laughs> but that's 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 a good thing about having an agency and they uh, they can help you with all the hassle the contract the payments you know yeah. especially the payments that's the thing i always hated you know like chasing people to for the payments that's yeah that's well, now now it's just like uh, when they do a request or a booking and they want to confirm it they have to pay the whole amount of money before i go and if yeah. there's if the whole m- amount is not on the bank account, I just don't go. Yeah. It sounds really like, uh, whoa, he's a big star and stuff, but that's the way it goes. Yeah. That's what an agency is for as well, like a booker. I don't think it's a weird and- thing because you have to deal with a lot of people from all over the world and uh, with a lot of costs beforehand, like flights that need to be booked, hotel that hotels yeah. that needs to be booked. Yeah. 
and um, if they screw That's you over, part if you're already there. Yeah, exactly. And if oh, you sorry. and and if they screw the you over, the internet is. Oh. oh, sorry. Is the internet still oh. there? <laughs> yeah, I can see you. Here. Okay, now it's it's good. Yeah, yeah. Perfect. Yeah. Um, okay. But if they screw you over and you you had to pay for the flight beforehand and you will get it back later and they don't pay you, you're fucked. So I think it's it's normal that you ask for your fee in advance. Of course, but th th you know this is a question. You know, um, I have a booking agency, but um, how do you say that? You know, it's a, the 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 thing we're talking about is for for artists that are already there that are getting the bookings and the requests. You know yeah, what I true. mean? Yeah. This question is made in a context of I am still not there. Do I need that booking agent right yeah. now? In that case, so, it's it's worth for the for the network. Yeah, yeah. So not, right now, if you're still starting, I don't know if a booker helps because your name is still not there, you know. Mm -hmm. But if your name is there and you had some good releases uh, there, on the, the, of course you need a uh, you need an agent, definitely. Okay. Yeah. Um, someone here asks about how you feel about social media, but we've already been through that. Um, he says. I look up to him as a producer, but I have no clue how his DJ sets are, and I, I barely see anything on his socials about this. Is this yeah. a conscious choice? Um, well, if I, you know, um, maybe yes, but maybe it's a part of me being lazy. Yeah, yeah like, like I said, we've been through it. Probably, it's probably that. Yeah. Yeah, and I must also admit, I'm I'm not a DJ who's playing like uh, 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 ten times a month. You know. Mm -hmm. You know, during the summer and like at the end of last year, I had a lot of work. Mm -hmm. And if you see it on my socials, I, I put a lot of DJ shows then. Mm -hmm. But uh, normally I, I just go do the gig. And if the gig is okay or so-so, like a lot of gigs in Holland, mm -hmm. then I don't post anything. Okay. And, you know, that's maybe the, the thing. When I'm DJing, I'm not go giving away my phone can you please film this or can you please film that? You know, it, I'm not like that. Yeah, yeah. I, I'm going to stand with the phone like this. Oh, look at me, the crowd and me. And then, no, I'm there for the music and the audience. And yeah. that's an, that's something I do, you know, naturally, you know, I, I, I don't, maybe I should do it, you know, film more of my DJ sets and stuff. Mm -hmm. But it's just, it's a combination of being lazy and being there for the crowd and not f for filming, you yeah. know what I'm saying? So it's 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 kind of a conscious choice, but you also will start doing monthly mixes from now on, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I'm going to put more effort in that, you know. And now we're in the down months, like January, mm -hmm. February, December. That's always a bit down, so you won't sh you won't see much things of DJ gigs on my socials right now yeah. because I'm more in the studio now. But uh, you know, in this summer and this spring and everything, I'm going to film everything. Okay, yeah, promise. Yeah, promise. Now it's on video. You're fucked. <laughs> Mm -hmm. um yeah cool that were all the questions actually um thanks for taking the time to do this like i said before uh i really learned a lot of, of new stuff about you like we already met a few times but definitely a few things i didn't know about you okay um and i'm really interested to see how 2019 will develop for you knowing that you had a breakthrough moment last week yeah uh, I really believe in those things, you know. Like I really believe in the fact that your mindset matters. Um, yeah. And I feel like you're in a good mindset right now. So I'm really curious to see where this will take you in the in the next year. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Me too. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> <That's>... <laughs> um, yeah. Thanks for taking the time and uh, good luck, man. You're welcome, mate. <laughs> hey, bye. Bye. <laughs>